All right, so um, welcome to this uh, public lecture. I'm delighted to be able to introduce our speaker today, Jennifer Chase. Uh, for many of you, Jennifer is very well known and probably doesn't need an introduction, but let me tell you a few things about her anyway. First thing, which is probably news to some of us who knew her, is she's just been elected a technical fellow at Microsoft, which is the highest scientific uh, accolade given at Microsoft. Uh, she's the director of the Microsoft New England lab right here, but that's not the only lab that she directs. She also directs a lab at New York City. Oh, I forgot to put the last one up there. Yes, huh? you forgot to put the last I one up there, to put which the is Manuba the in Montreal, which is uh, um, a new lab that she's yeah. undertaken. And just in case you think, you know, three places all in the, the uh, <clears throat> North America is not sufficient, well, let me also tell you about a little group that she heads in Herzliya in Israel, too. So, um, how does a person manage to manufacture so much time? Well, she <coughs> does so by actually adding a few more responsibilities. She was the past chair of the ACM Turing Award Committee. She's on the board of the Simons Institute for Theory of Computing. And God knows how many other boards that I cannot <laughs> enumerate. The number of awards that have come her way are also just too many to enumerate. I'll just mention one of those, which is probably relevant to us uh, all here, the John Von Neumann uh, Lecture Award from SIAM, which is the highest uh, award that the SIAM gives, uh, which is given for a person who's not only doing excellent research, but also a great speaker. And Jennifer is one of the most coveted speakers I'm uh, aware of. <laughs> and uh, finally, let me tell you a little bit, all this time that I've been talking about all her professional activities, well, she's also been doing a little bit of research on the side, uh, and some of this has led to the beautiful theory of graph limits, which tells us how to look at the larger and larger graphs and at the same time has been expanding the scope of networks and graph theory to cover areas like biology, economics, and learning. And today we'll hear a little bit more about network science from Jennifer Chase. Please join me. Wow. I hate high expectations. I, <laughs> I, oh my, where did I leave my clicker? Does anyone know where the clicker is? This is not a good thing. Oh, there it is. It's by Noga's foot. Noga, Noga stole, stole my clicker. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, great. Well, I'm really happy to be here. I was told this was a public lecture. Um, I didn't realize I was going to have so many of my esteemed senior colleagues here. This is going to be you know, on a general level because I know there are several undergraduates here whom I met and, you know, and I want them to be able to see the full spectrum of, of this and hopefully understand a lot of it. Okay, whoops. So, I'm going to talk about observed networks. I mean, I'm obviously not going to talk about all observed networks, but the kinds that I'd like to try to describe. Um, I'll talk about classes of mathematical and algorithmic problems on networks, and then a couple of specific examples. So one is some recent work we've done on uh, collaborative filtering, which is like on Amazon, you know, if you like this, you'll also like that, or on Netflix, you know, if you like this movie, you'd also like that movie, on very sparse bipartite networks. Uh, and I'll also talk about reconstruction of what are now being called multiomic networks, genomic, proteomic, uh, metabolic networks. Okay, so everywhere we look, we see networks, at least I see networks. Those are the glasses that I put on, so really everywhere I look, I see them. Uh, so, I'm gonna get down here so I can see up there. Um, so, I'm a mathematician, so how do I model a network? I model it as a graph. It has vertices and it has edges. They can be undirected or directed edges. And there are many types of networks. So yet another esteemed, more senior colleague. Everywhere I'm looking, I'm seeing not just networks, but networks of senior colleagues. <laughs> OK. Um, <laughs> Yeah, that's a social network is what it is. So there are technological, social, economic, and biological, and I suppose there are aspects of this network that have all those properties, but I was thinking of the social aspects. The senior colleagues in the talk is the archaeological. 
Okay, so here are some examples of technological networks. So we can look at the autonomous system internet. So um, harvard.edu or AOL or MSN, these are autonomous systems. They're systems that could be walled off. You know, if there were a, a virus or a worm attack, you could wall them off. And they're connected to each other, okay, forming the internet. Then there's a World Wide Web. These are um, directed networks. You have hyperlinks, which, you know, just because I point to Noga's web page doesn't mean Noga points to my web page. And a another one I want to mention, which I think is really important, is uh, data center networks. About 5% um, of the power in the U.S. is consumed by data centers. So, you know, when you're thinking, oh, I do a search and an answer comes to me and it's free, well, you probably know that you are the product being sold in that search. <laughs> but what does some of the money go towards? Some of the money goes towards the power <laughs> to power these data centers. And so understanding the structure of the data centers and how the data is moved around and doing operations research on that is actually a really interesting problem, especially if you want to decrease the power consumption. Okay, there are social networks, there are offline networks, like networks of senior colleagues, or epidemiological networks. You know, if you um, followed, uh, followed Ebola recently, there were epidemiological networks that people were looking at. There are offline activity-based social networks. So sociologists for years studied the karate club, which split into two pieces and what happened to those pieces. There are online networks. So Facebook and LinkedIn are the big undirected online networks. There are tons of directed networks. Twitter is a directed network. You know, people follow somebody. Um, Email is a directed network because, you know, I, I mean, I'm allowed to send a message to Madhu if he sends a message to me, but if I'm following the network, it may be that I send him many more messages than he sends me. Uh, <laughs> I send a lot of email. Um, there I am, mobile phone. Um, some of our researchers a few years ago did crisis communication via online networks. A lot of really interesting structures there. Economic networks, so there are offline networks like lending networks, the Eurozone banks or tripartite networks of firms and VCs and influentials. People like uh, Darun Asimoglu and um, Asuas Daglar have done really interesting work on the economics of some of these real world networks. Uh, there are also online networks, so that autonomous system internet that I told you about actually has three levels. So if you're at the top level and the you know, big internet service providers are at the top level, then you can send your traffic anywhere for free. If you're on the second level, if your traffic gets routed up through the first level, you have to pay someone in the first level. If you're on the third level, you have to pay both the second and the first level. And so when you look at the routing of messages on the internet, if you don't understand the economic incentives, they, it looks kind of bizarre. It looks very non-optimal, but you know, you're not trying to get a shortest path. You're, you're trying to optimize also for the cost. And then you know, um, a lot of the internet is based on online ads. I mean, both face, well, Facebook and Google certainly are powered by online ads. And, you know, we've just been hearing about what some of those online ads were. Um, anyway, this is a, a, an online ad exchange, and you have, uh, you know, when you have um, the, the people who are viewing, and you have the places where, you know, the New York Times or whatever, where things might be placed, and then um, intermediaries. Okay, biological networks. There are phylogenetic networks, you know, we look at what species exist today and we ask where might, where might they have come from. Molecular biology, so genomic and proteomic networks. Um, so here, for example, a number of years ago we did 
we found this um, pheromone pathway in, in yeast using some data that people had collected on those networks. There are neurological networks. So Jeff Lickman at Harvard um, does the Connectome Project. There are several groups that, that do this. So there, um, you know, so he takes um, slices of a, of a mouse brain and from those he tries to stitch together what the physical connections are. Not that every brain won't be different, but it will be, you know, a sample of what a mouse brain would look like. A really complicated problem. Okay, there are, I mean, the only connectome that we really know well is the um, flatworm, which has 302 neurons. But we're trying, and, and then we can do really interesting things with that. Um, so we're trying to get that for much more complex uh, uh, organisms. Okay, so what are the kinds of problems? And I'm going to separate them into several categories. Modeling networks, I, I've spent a lot of the past 15 years or so modeling different kinds of networks. Um, sampling from and machine learning of networks, which turn out to be related to each other. Um, there's processes on networks. I'll give you some examples of that. There are algorithms on networks. So some of you who are in Boaz's intro class on the theory of computing or learning some basic algorithms. You can also think about algorithms on networks, and I'll give you some examples of those. And then there are what are called network reconstruction algorithms, where you see partial data on a network, sometimes very sparse partial data, and you try to reconstruct the entire network from that. Okay, so modeling networks. Well, first of all, in in many of the networks I would like to model, um, there are certain properties, like a small diameter. So actually, um, in 1929, there was a, um, a Hungarian author who wrote a sh short story in which he said that every person on Earth is connected by at most six hops to every other person. I don't know how he came up with that number, because Stanley Milgram, in the 50s, did an experiment in which he found roughly that number. He, this is, you know, via local hops, okay? So um, Stanley Milgram said, uh, you know, I'm going to take somebody in Wichita and I'm going to ask them to try to mail a postcard to a teacher, an elementary school teacher, in Worcester, Massachusetts, okay? And I'm going to ask the person in Wichita to send it along the path that they think is going to get there the fastest, okay? And so this was done, and at the end of the day, it was about six hops, maximum of six hops, okay? If you think about it, what would I do? You know, I'd probably, like, send it to the most famous person I know, because then they could route it down really quickly. Like, I send it to Bill Gates. I figure, okay, he knows somebody in education, okay? And, you know, and then somebody in education is going to pay a lot of attention when Bill Gates sends a postcard. So, um, not that he knows the teacher, but he'll know somebody in school systems. will then know somebody in Massachusetts school systems, that kind of thing. And power law degree distributions. So what happens is when I ask, um, what's the probability that I have K neighbors, okay? Um, some of the kinds of things we study in elementary discrete mathematics, um, things fall off very quickly. They fall off exponentially. A power law is much slower. If I ask what's the probability that I have, you know, k neighbors, it would fall off like 1 over k to a power, much more slowly. So these are the long tails that people talk about, which are often, you know, um, like characteristic of human interaction. You tend to find these long tails. Okay, so I'm going to mention two types of models very briefly. One is growth models. So among the growth models, some are probabilistic growth models, like the preferential attachment model. At each time step, a new vertex is created, and it attaches to M-old vertices 
with a probability proportional to the degree of the old vertex. One could do more complicated variants of this, like we did with Costas when he was a graduate student a long time ago. One can also do game theoretic things which are not probabilistic, okay, um, which you're optimizing something. But a, another class of models, which I began to think much more about recently in the context of learning, are latent feature models. So, um, or, and people are using graph these graph limits for this. So each vertex has unobserved features. So let's say the, the vertices um, correspond to, to people. And, you know, and I look at Madhu and I, I don't know maybe his preferences on food. I know a little bit about his preferences on alcohol. But um, I've observed those. <laughs> it's beer. Um, you know, but there are, there are other, many what, yeah, many samples, many, many samples were drawn. Um, you know, but, but there are other things, what kinds of vacations he likes and, you know, what kind of literature he likes or doesn't like. So these are, these are unobserved, but then I say, so I can look at Facebook and say all these people on Facebook have these different characteristics and they're connecting to each other with a probability that depends on those latent features, okay? They, you know, you, you tend to connect to people who are similar to you on these latent features. Okay, so that's models. There are lots and lots of models, but those are two kind of different, different ways of thinking about them. Okay, sampling from things. So if I look at the World Wide Web, it's very, very large. Um, and it's growing, so how do we sample from it, for example, to calculate page rank? And if you don't know how to calculate page rank, I'll show you that in a slightly later slide. Um, well, to deal with this, starting oh, over 10 years ago now, um, with Christian Borg, so essentially all the work I talk about is joint with Christian, so I have observed almost all of his latent features. Um, He's also my husband. Uh, Latsy Lovas, um, Vera Shoj and Kadi Vestragami, the older Latsy Lovas, Vera Shoj and Kadi Vestragami. Um, we developed a theory of graph limits. So you can, you can take a graph. This, this graph here is called the half graph. And you can write it as what's called an adjacency matrix. So I could put a one or I could put a black square if two vertices are connected to each other, so this is like vertex one, two, three, four, blah, 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 and, and vertex one is just connected to one vertex on the other side, but you know, this one is connected to two vertices and so on, and then I could just like say, okay, I'm gonna take this one by one square and I'm just gonna take the limit of it, and it's gonna look like this, okay? There are all kinds of subtleties there, like, you know, um, the, uh, uh, if if um, the graphs are what is called um, what is called exchangeable, that I can mix them up, and it doesn't matter what name they have, what label they have, then I could have mixed them up differently when I labeled, you know, one, two, three, and it could look like a grayscale thing here. So there are all kinds of questions about uniqueness and measurability and stuff like that. So that's that's why there's been probably, you know, a couple of thousand pages worth of papers, maybe 500 of them by us, on various aspects of this. Okay, but what we really care about are sparse graphs, and why do we care about sparse? Oh, I didn't even tell you what a dense graph and a sparse graph was, I'm so sorry. A dense graph is a graph in which you are connected to a positive fraction of all of the other nodes on the graph. And if you're talking about a finite but growing graph, you say, okay, you're, as it grows, you're connected to, let's say, 0.2 times the size of the network, okay? Like on Facebook, that just is not true, okay? It's a sparse graph. You're connected to little o of n, okay? You're definitely not scaling like, like n. So that's a sparse graph, and most of these parallel graphs we look at are actually sparse graphs. And so with Yufei, who's sitting right there, um, when he was a student, uh, 
we did limits of sparse graphs with power law tails and then with, oh, and this is Henry Cohn who's at Microsoft with whom we've done a lot of work over the past few years. And then this is Nina Holden who is just finishing up at MIT and we had a different way of getting um, sparse power law graphs out and interestingly, the only case in which those two kinds of limits coincide is, is the limiting case of dense graphs. Okay. So sampling from, well, how can you take a single snapshot of Facebook, let's say, or LinkedIn today and learn the network to predict, for example, how the network will look when it's twice its size or the results of certain things that you want to do on the network, A-B testing or collaborative filtering. And the answer is, um, okay, so what you want to do is you want to get an estimate of the graph limit. So I'm going to look at Facebook today and I'm going to say, let me try to fit it with a graph on. Let me try to fit it so that, let me try to find a, a function w of x and y so that um, when I ask what is the probability that node x on Facebook is connected to node y on Facebook, it will be w of x and y, okay? And, um, this is kind of uh, up to measure preserving transformations and stuff having to do with the fact that you relabel vertices. But the point is, you could say, okay, you're a new employee at Facebook and Facebook just hands you, you walk in and they say, okay, this is day one, here's the graph on of Facebook, okay? If nothing is changing in fundamental ways in the way that it's being, um, in the way that it's being generated, okay? And so what you do is you get an estimate of this and you use it to predict how the network would look at a later time because now I can just generate realizations of it from this function. And the second thing is that using these graphons, we get algorithms for various kinds of things. And in fact, um, I'll tell you about the collaborative filtering one if I get through my talk fast enough, which was done with Devavrat Shah, who's at MIT, and Christina Lee, who was Deborah Vratz, grad student and an intern with us, now is a postdoc with us and will be a Cornell faculty member next year. Okay, processes on networks. So, flow of information. Okay, many of these networks that I've talked about are generated from random processes like that preferential attachment or more complex ones, okay? Now you might have a random dynamic process on top of that randomly generated network. Like you might ask about information flowing and you might have models of how information may flow. And John Kleinberg and various collaborators have worked on a lot of aspects of this. Another thing you could ask is, you know, again on these power law graphs that look like how humans interact with each other, um, how, how would a virus spread? okay, over that. And so there are epidemiological questions and, uh, and so we've worked on those and other people have worked on them. It's, it's very interesting. And then there's viral marketing. So let's say that, um, you know, I'm a marketer and, you know, I produce bright red shoes and Christian, you can put your feet up. He has really cool bright red shoes. And I want to sell a lot of these bright red shoes. And so I will ask, oh, I'm, I'm going to give out coupons that give 50% off on bright red shoes. And I can give out a limited number of coupons. And I've got this weighted network, which is Facebook, where the weights are maybe how many likes people have given Christian for various things he said so that somehow they think he's cool or they think he's whatever. And so I say, who do I give it to? Who do I give these coupons to on Facebook? So that, you know, um, I'll get, if I, if I give out these half price red shoes, you know, I'll get a lot of people to buy red shoes. Okay, and there are very nice models of, of that. Okay, algorithms. So here's a simple example of PageRank for those of you who may not know. This was actually done, uh, okay, well, let me first say, Early search engines like AltaVista, which is for some of you before you were born, um, 
would use content and language to find the most relevant web pages. And then later search engines, Google Bing, used the structure of the web graph, so graph theory and algorithms, to find the most relevant web pages. And how did they do this? Well, you know, Bryn and Page, when they were grad students at Stanford, came up with this. They said, um, let me take a random walk along the hyperlinks of, of the web. And, um, and I don't want to get stuck. You know, sometimes I'm taking a random walk and I walk to something that has no outlinks whatsoever. So either, you know, with a probability of one seventh or every seventh time, I just don't follow a link. I, um, I uniformly choose some other site. Okay? And let's just keep doing this and keep doing this and keep doing this. Well, which sites are going to get visited a lot? The ones, to lowest order, the ones that have the most inlinks. Okay? And so PageRank says keep going until, you know, everything settles down. And uh, the amount of time someone spends on your web page will be your, I mean, I'll rank how much time is spent on every web page, and that'll be the page rank of the page. And then, you know, search engines like Google now use, you know, 500 hacks on top of this. But that's the basic algorithm. Okay, and later ranking algorithms, so people knew that to lowest order it was the amount of inlinks you have, and so web spammers started to say, hey, I can move your web page up, you know, you give me so much money and, you know, I'll make your web page come up in the, in, in the regular ranking so you don't have to buy an ad, and then Google started pulling them off and saying, hey, this is, you know, you're, you're using web spamming. And then there were lawsuits back and forth because these companies said Google has destroyed our business. So much, much easier is to do this algorithmically and say, you know, I'm going to, in my algorithm, I'm going to detect anomalous features in certain ways and just downweight them a little bit. Just give them a little, a little decrease and that's enough to, to wipe them out. Okay, so algorithms. So we just learned about ranking algorithms, right? And we know, oh, and, and then much more recently, um, still a while ago now, uh, we came up with sublinear time ranking algorithms, which don't get things perfectly, but they get things pretty well in sublinear time in the size of the network, which is important because these networks are big. Um, Anyway, we see that, you know, PageRank led to some company that some of you know. Um, clustering algorithms like collaborative filtering on bipartite networks, you know, um, a, lot, a lot of the value of Netflix certainly comes from that and Amazon sells a lot more with collaborative filtering on, you know, people and, and products. And, um, and I'll talk a little bit about, um, about this thing that we've done recently with really, really sparse sampling, you can still do this. Um, algorithms for web hosting. So I don't know if any of you have heard of Akamai, but it's, you know, it's in Kendall Square. It was started by a very good computer scientist, Tom Layton, who may still be a faculty member at MIT. And, um, and so it used to be like, like if there were a YouTube video that everybody wanted to get to, um, you know, and everyone tried to get to that site it would just go down because too many people were trying to. So how do you mirror, you know, put, put mirrored sites like that? And where, where do you put them to make it likely that people can access from different places and it doesn't go down? And that was actually either a Fox or Stock paper years ago. Um, there are other things. We did multicasting, which is kind of almost an, an inverse of that many years later. Um, Oh, so if I want to do viral marketing, um, uh, uh, Kempe, Kleinberg, and Tardosh had done this um, uh, with some slower algorithms, and we did this much later with some uh, sublinear time algorithms. There are other things, algorithms for recommendation systems on online trust networks. So let's say I wanted to use um, my Facebook contacts to give me recommendations. Okay, so I would have to go look through my contacts and say, whom do I trust in a certain domain? 
okay? I don't trust anybody in all domains, but you know, oh, I find that I like the same restaurants as this person, so I give a lot of weight on, on that. Well, this was, this was actually done with Adam, who's sitting back there. Um, and, uh, and yeah, that was, that, that was like, that's, that's how I got to know you, and then before I hired you and everything, yeah, okay. Um, <laughs> What? I can just say Kalai. Well, you I loved anyway. So, <laughs> but and then I realized that he was smart too. So, <laughs> okay. So, um, so then you could, how, how do you propagate this information and, and have it come back to you and give you a, a recommendation, you know? So I have friends and who, whom I trust on food and they have friends whom they trust on food. and. It was a lot harder when there was some distrust in there, so we did that too. Okay, so network reconstruction algorithms. Oh my, I'm running slowly. Um, so phylogenetic network reconstruction. So you just see a little bit, you see what's present today. You wanna reconstruct everything that happened in the past. How accurately can you do that? Genomic and prote proteomic regulatory networks. You see a little bit. You wanna reconstruct what's going on inside your cell. Brain neural networks, the connectome, and identifying neuron types. So these are really interesting problems. And then if you have the connectome, like you do for the flatworm, these 302 neurons with the wiring diagram, can you, do, can you understand learning processes on those networks? So they put the little flatworm in different kinds of environments, different light, different food, and they try to reconstruct what learning process might be taking place. You know, we really, we care about that a lot because um, actually, you know, when plaque starts to take out some of our neurons, we don't, we, we unlearn things, right? Okay, so I'll talk, I'll talk about that. But the first thing I'm gonna talk about is network completion on sparse networks. So here we have Netflix or Amazon or YouTube, we have people and for Netflix, we have movies and we have ratings, right? And I wanna fill in the missing ratings. Okay, or for social network completion. So a lot of, um, a lot of economists are studying um, India and developmental economics and, their, and, and development economics and trying to understand what the underlying social networks are. And it's a very big problem. How do I take some sparse data and try to generalize from that? Or weighted social networks, you know, with the, you know, it's the number of, of mails you send or the number of likes you, you have. So there are weights on on the some frequency of, of interaction. Okay, so these are actually just matrix completion problems. So, <clears throat> so I have people, row one to row n, and I have movies and column one to column n. Let's say I have the same number of people as movies. If not, I could just a max. Um, and I'm trying to fill in something that I don't know. Well, it turns out that because relabeling doesn't matter here, it's just the characteristics that matter and some ergodicity, um, Aldous and Hoover, a, a theorem they proved tells us that I can represent this as a latent variable model. So I can represent this perfectly as some function of the unseen characteristics of the people and the unseen characteristics of the movies and then some randomness, which let's say is just a Bernoulli randomness. And so the expectation of this, I can write as one of these graphon functions where these are the unseen characteristics of the people, the latent, aspects of the people, these are latent characteristics of the movies, and I'm gonna observe each one independently with probability P. And I'm really hoping I can do this for P very, very small because I don't wanna go looking, oh, or it may be that I only have very sparse data. Like on Netflix, how much data do we actually have? How many of the movies on Netflix has, you know, has Madhu actually seen, right? Not, not that many of them. Um, more than he should have probably, but not too many of them. 
And then um, I'm calling it the same D, otherwise I can take the max, but what is the dimension of the latent space? And this can actually be quite big, right? The, the, you know, what are the characteristics about people that matter for their liking certain movies? And what are the characteristics of movies that matter, okay? A lot of things can affect that. Okay, and so, you know, given the observed data, can we learn, can we learn this or maybe even get the full distribution? And previously, um, Chatterjee, who's a wonderful probabilist at Stanford, had the result that um, I would have to observe at least this many of the, of the entries. So let's say, you know, the latent variable space was 50. Okay, 50 characteristics matter. And so, you know, this is 1 over n to the 2 over 50, roughly. 1 over n to the 25th, which actually, I mean, that sounds pretty small, but, um, wait, is that right? Yeah. Two, no, 1 25th, okay? <laughs> or 1, yeah, 1 25th. So, so, that's at, so it's the 25th root of n, or if there are 100 characteristics that matter, it's the 50th root of n, okay, 1 over the 50th root of n. I would actually like to be able, I mean, so, so Madhu has to have seen, you know, the, the 50th root of all movies on Netflix, which um, probably mean he would never get any work done. Um, so. Here's the challenge of sparsity. The challenge of sparsity is that previous algorithms said, you know, I'm, I'm going to look among my friends who are similar to me and I'm going to find an overlap in what movies they've seen and I'm going to use that to do a comparison. So I say that two people are similar. Well, now I'm going to say, no, I don't have to have, I don't have to have a direct movie connection to Medu. There doesn't have to be a movie we share. Maybe if all of the people with whom he shares movies might share a movie with me, okay? So, uh, so I've seen these two movies, and then those movies are also seen by those guys, and Madhu's seen this movie, the, these two movies, and oh, there's no overlap there. And now we go on, and these people have seen some other movies, and these people have seen some other movies, and oh, now there's overlap. So I've gone out a couple of steps on this bipartite graph, and there's overlap. And, oh my, I didn't mean to do that. There it goes. Um, so how many, how many um, movies have to be out there to have some reasonable chance of overlap? Well, it's something called the birthday paradox, which if, for those of you who don't know it, it basically says, hey, if you're in a classroom with 30 kids, it's likely that somebody else has the same birthday. You know, you don't have to have like 300 kids in the classroom to have likely same birthdays, more like 30. Um, and so I want the boundary to be this big, which means how far out do I have to go? Um, so this is how far out I, I have to go. And, and P is the sampling density. So, you know, it's, it's, it's how many movies you have to have seen. And then I'm going to compare the product ratings along the path. And we use um, some things that Abe and Sandin had, had developed. And you don't have to understand this, really. Um, this, is, this is just coming out in, in NIPS in December. But um, right now, what we've got is that Madhu just has to have seen of order 1 over n of the movies, much better. So it leaves him some time to do something else with his life besides watch movies, instead of, you know, one over the 50th root of n, okay? I mean, the, the, the number in front is, it's the d squared in front is growing, but it's not, you know. So, <clears throat> and this is all using graphon stuff, graphon estimation stuff. Okay, now for something totally different for the next 10, 15 minutes. Network reconstruction. Algorithms for cancer genomics and proteomics. So the standard dogma, which, you know, has gotten more and more subtle and more and more exceptions over the years, but the DNA is transcribed to RNA, which is transcribed to proteins. 
and then the proteins go, some of them, and they sit on the DNA and they cause um, certain parts of the DNA to be transcribed more and less, and so you have this feedback mechanism. So you have a protein interactome. And um, problems with these networks are the source of most human diseases. Um, so how do we infer, I mean, certainly in things like cancer where you have a regulatory dysfunction going on. So how do we infer the network structure from partial data? We don't know every protein that's in there. We don't know every, every protein that interacts with every other protein. And how can we identify particular nodes in the network that might be responsible for dysregulation? And then maybe you're one or more of the nodes possible targets for drugs, okay? So an example, this is something that people don't do anymore. They, they do much more mRNA, but this is a nice simple example. It tells us um, and, and when we started working on this, people were using microarrays. Um, they tell us which gene is expressed in the presence of which other gene under a particular set of circumstances. So um, one set of circumstances, I take a snapshot and I say, oh, this protein has been transcribed and that protein has been transcribed and that, and then I take another snapshot in some other conditions and this protein and this protein, but not that one and, and, and so on. And from the differential expression of a particular gene, we infer the node weight of the corresponding protein. So this is, you know, so so um, so I'm 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 gonna so I'm gonna make a network which has proteins on it, and I'm gonna say the weight of this protein is is how much it's expressed above or below its background value. Okay, and now I want to know something about whether protein A is interacting with protein B, okay? And for that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say for this particular organism, you know, maybe a human, maybe a mouse, maybe a worm, um, for this particular organism, how often have I seen, do I believe, this protein is interacting directly with that protein? Now this is very noisy data because I can think that they're interacting directly and they're actually interacting via some intermediary. So the data is very, very noisy, okay? But there is some estimate and you can look this up for humans and for other organisms. So the edge weights are organism specific, whereas the node weights are in this snapshot at this moment. I have this much of this node and that much of that node. Okay, and I want to find the network most likely to have produced the data. So the drug discovery paradigm, there's all kinds of data that goes in, computational models, and then I go, oh, the problem seems to be this protein and that protein, or this gene and that gene, and let me see if I can upregulate them or downregulate them. Okay, so now here's the mathematical problem. It's called the Steiner tree problem. So I'm given a graph with vertices and edges. The cost of the edges, I'm, I'm going to say is Cij. It could be zero, it could be positive. And I'm going to take a subset of my node. So let's say that I have, you know, 5,000 proteins and I'm going to take a subset of them, like 363 of them, particular ones, okay? And what I'm going to ask you to do is I'm going to ask you to find the tree containing those 363 nodes, could contain more, but it has to contain at least those 363, which minimizes the cost of the edges connecting them. So the solution, in general, the minimizing tree contains other nodes in addition to the terminals, and these are called Steiner nodes. And there are a lot of computational issues around finding this. This is a hard problem. We have a, a very fast algorithm which, which does this. Okay, so let's look at an example. Here's an equilateral triangle with three nodes, all of which must be connected, and the cost is just the length of the edges. So if I say, oh, I'm only allowed to use the edges that are there, well then, I have three obvious solutions, okay? 
what if I let myself add some extra edges? Okay, now the sum of these three is less than this length. Okay, let's say it's just the length. And so this guy is called a Steiner node, okay? I wasn't trying to connect it. I mean, actually this happened with AT&T customers who were told you have to pay, like we have to lay wire and you have to pay for this. And they said, wow, if instead of having to connect these three sites, we ask you to connect these four sites, then it's cheaper, okay? Um, so that's what they did. So computation. So we use this belief propagation thing, um, and it's very, very fast, okay? Uh, now let me give you the biological variant of this problem, which I'm going to use, which is um, I'm not going to say that a node has to be in there or not. I'm not going to say, oh, these 363 nodes have to be in there and nothing else has to be in there. I'm going to assign prizes to each of the nodes. And um, it might be, okay, so I give different prizes to these, to these nodes, okay? Um, and, and I'm going to say, uh, try to get, okay, try to not have very expensive edges between them. Um, and since I want this thing to be minimized, and this is a positive number, uh, try to get as many of the prizes as, as you can. So, you know, it's like a Easter egg hunt or something. Get as many as you can, and there are like different prizes for different Easter eggs, except Easter eggs are connected to each other with edges, okay? And this turns into the other standard Steiner tree problem is all of these go to infinity. So then it's like if I had 363 positive prizes and I took lambda to infinity, then it would just go over to the old one where I needed this 363 out of 5,000. Okay, so mapping to biological data. The CIJs are going to be determined by my having looked over all the experiments on the organism and how likely protein I is to interact with protein J. And uh, these prizes are going to be determined by, for example, how much the protein is overexpressed or underexpressed relative to background, or we've used this in a lot of cases, fractions of tumors with mutations, all kinds of things, okay? So this, you know, conforms to whatever data I have available. Okay, so Steiner nodes. So in the standard Steiner tree problem, nodes which are in the solution, like that thing in the middle, um, but which I didn't tell you had to be there, are called Steiner nodes. So in the prize collecting Steiner tree, um, nodes which have low prizes but land up in the solution, and I have to have a threshold for low, are called Steiner nodes. So here is a network that, I, that I'm giving you where this means a big prize, this means a little prize, this means an expensive edge, that is a cheap edge, okay? And let's say with the value of lambda I gave and the numbers that I assigned to the prizes, this is the solution to it, okay? This is the minimizer. I got like all the big juicy ones, and, um, and I didn't get many of the heavy edges, okay? So I'm doing pretty well. This guy would be called a Steiner node because I wouldn't go out of my way to get him, but he gets me these two other ones, okay, these two other big prizes. And in the context of a gene regulatory network, Steiner nodes correspond to proteins whose genes are not differentially expressed. They're sitting essentially at background value but which nevertheless seem likely to participate in the network because they bring in other relevant things. So I'm looking at cancer and I see certain things underexpressed and overexpressed, and I don't think this protein has, to do, has anything to do with it because it's sitting at background value. However, maybe it does because it's the protein that can connect me with these other two that are very highly expressed. And so an example of this is glioblastoma. So glioblastoma is a really terrible cancer. Um, brain can it's a form of brain cancer. About 10,000 people in the U.S. die of it each year. Uh, it, it is probably the deadliest of the common cancers. Uh, 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 Ted Kennedy died of it. John McCain is dying of it now. An uncle I really love died of it. It's a horrible disease. If you have um, surgery, which you almost always, you know, are, are 
are disabled in some way from it. Like my uncle couldn't read. He could, could understand if something were read to him, but he couldn't read after the surgery. And chemo and radiation and all this other stuff, you last about a year. Okay. Oh, and it's much more common in men than in women, four to one. Okay, so can we find the pathways that, um, that link this? Okay. So, this is the resulting pathway. Things mean a little differently than they did in the other pictures that I had. Here, um, the, um, the redness is how big a prize or penalty you're, you're, you're going to get. So you want to include the really red ones. Um, and the size has to do with how central the node is. So I could have gotten this network without any sizes in it. The circles and the triangles are different kinds of them. They are phosphorylated proteins or transcription factors or something. But the, I, I could have done this diagram without the sizes and then calculated the centrality of each of the nodes and the ones that are very central, I blow up. Okay? So if you land up looking at this, if, if you're a cancer specialist, that makes a lot of sense to you because you see all these things that are really important that are showing up here. But then you ask, like, what the hell is this, okay? Because this is very central, okay, it's big, it's very central, but it's not red at all, so I shouldn't want to be including it. So maybe it's one of these things that connects other things. So the top five nodes ranked by in-betweenness, centrality, are these. SRC is known to be active, but there was this one that we talked about that I pointed out to you with the question marks. And it's the estrogen receptor. So this is the first pathway link between glioblastoma and gender. Okay, it's four times as common in men as in women. And I mean, in vitro things don't mean that much, but if you throw in EGFR inhibitor, and EGFR was the thing that was reddest at the top, it's a surface protein, um, and estrogen, estradiol is basically estrogen. It inhibits the, the growth of the GBM cells in cancer better than not including the, the estrogen. Now, you know, not at all clear how to get estrogen into the brain, right? Um, I know, exactly. I'm trying to get estrogen into all these brains all the time, but that's a different story. Yeah? <laughs> Because that's how likely the proteins are to be interacting with each other. Over the thousands of experiments that have been performed, how often have people concluded in the literature that these two interact okay. with each other? So is it some kind of a low probability or something? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So multiple signaling pathways. Well, we do this with, because very often there are multiple things that are going on in the cells, usually triggered by different proteins. Um, sitting in the membranes and something attaches and then a cascade happens. And so we handle this by putting in an artificial node that connects everything and then doing a Steiner forest instead of a Steiner tree. And we find um, parallel working pathways. So if we do that on glioblastoma, we get this. And this corresponds to the one I showed you before, but then there are other pathways that arise when I allow there to be disjoint pathways. Okay, and the final thing I want to tell you about is using some machine learning um, in breast cancer data from the Cancer Genome Atlas. And so here's what we did. We said each patient, so we, we got data on each patient, and we said for each patient, we are going to figure out the Steiner forest. So instead of just a Steiner tree, it's a, it's a forest, okay? And then I'm going to learn the individual forests, and I'm going to cluster similar forests. So I have these two different people, but their forests look pretty similar to each other. And then when I've clustered them, I'm going to say I want to extract shared characteristics, and then I want to say, you know what, these things that came up as Steiner nodes were not believed in advance to be important, but my analysis is telling me that they are important. 
So if, there, if something comes up as a Steiner node in cluster one, I'm going to add to the prize of that protein in all the other clusters. And I'm going to keep iterating this process until it settles down. Okay, because it may be that something that doesn't show up as a Steiner node in one is actually really it's a, an important protein in another. And, and we iterate, and what you come up with is highly patient-specific networks which have input from the networks of other patients. And in fact, we found a subclass whose Steiner nodes implied that they might be treatable with drugs for this is a certain kind of gastrointestinal tumor. And we did this, I mean, it, it got published in 2014. We probably did it in 2013. Six months ago, um, they started using this for certain kinds of breast cancer, this drug for certain kinds of breast cancer. So I'm not sure if it was due to our work or not, but some biologists I know who saw this were like, oh my God, this is your, you know, this is what you found. So uh, I'm not sure of the causality there, but it, it seems to be very effective for certain clusters of breast cancer. Okay, so everywhere we look, we see these networks. The things that um, you were learning about in Boaz's class and in other classes, um, you know, graph theory, combinatorics, probability, game theory, algorithms um, are all very important. The results include new theories, theorems, experimental predictions, new business models, all those algorithms. This does not mean if you come up with a network algorithm, you get a unicorn, but um, <laughs> it's, it's one way, it's not the other way, you know. But, um, but anyway, those unicorns, many of them did start with a particular algorithm and new personalized drug therapies. Okay. Happy to take questions. Are there any um, connections or Graph, graph ops for sparse graphs to property testing for sparse graphs? You mentioned in the beginning that the... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, a, years ago when we did the dense graphs, we did property testing. Um, you know, we have not... Have, have you thought that through at all, Christian? No, we... That's a, that's a really good question. It's a really good question. If Maybe there's this... What? Yeah, um, but that's a really, really good question. If there's a graduate student out here looking for, <laughs> like, because that was one of the first things that we did with the dense graphons was was property testing. It's a very, very good question. Okay, and as I said, it it actually sounds right for like a a thesis problem if if there is something there. <laughs> so, yeah. Something about the belief of patient for, uh, for solving the Steiner. Mm -hmm. So this is some sort of heuristic. It's a heuristic. It's a heuristic. Yeah, I'm, I mean, you know, can the the. Prove something for some model or for some. I mean, we can um, we can prove things for uh, for B matchings. Okay, so B matchings we can prove in certain cases um, uh, con convergence actually fast convergence to the correct solution. So, yeah, I mean, that's as far, I mean, that's very far from where we're applying it. But, or, or you can just think of matching. You don't have to think of B matching, but no one knows what B matching is. But yes, for, for matching. Oh, there's another example. Yeah. Trees. And spanning trees. David Gamarnik and some others did the spanning trees. So there are a few. Um, it's, it's very hard. I'm, <laughs> I believe there's a lot there because we've been able to prove it in a few special cases and it works really well in practice, but there's a lot of unproven. So in practical, when you apply it to the networks, you apply it when uh, you know that it works well because... Well, there are, there are libraries, um, Steiner Tree libraries, uh, and, and so we apply it, we've applied it to those libraries and it is both faster and getting, I mean, no one knows what the true minimum is, right? But, 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 but we get better minima faster 
than all the other methods that are out there. So, I mean, it's, you know, that, that's, so we benchmarked it and it does well. Okay, so it, it's benchmarked to do well and, you know, in these very idealized cases we can, we can do, so I would love to do more proofs along those lines. They, it, it gets, it gets hard. Huh? Yeah, just mentioned for my students and our uh, undergraduate audience that Steiner tree is uh, a problem that the uh, CARP showed to, to be NP-complete. Uh, yeah, it's, it's a hard one. <laughs> well, maybe you ask right, so, so you're not going to find the actual Let your minimum. Students prove it's a factor of 100 approximation. <laughs> <laughs> Next problem. Yeah. More questions? So I had a question. Oh yeah, um, so we had first work on that where we actually came up with a representation. It, it was a subtle thing because what we did was you, we had to come up with a really bizarre representation. In the regular representation where you had nodes and edges, there was nothing you could do. So we represented the graph as being distance from a root. So from every, for, for every node on the graph, it was a magnitude but also a distance from a chosen root. And then we would choose in the applications as the root, we would choose um, some protein that was really known to be very important, like a membrane protein. So that representation um, is published in FizRev letters in like 2008. And then the benchmark stuff and, the, and our first application, which was to yeast, was in PNAS in 2011. And then we've used it in many other things since then. So, can you show me uh, regarding the uh, data that you grabbed and then you found this protein that's in there you don't to How often can you use that? So, I assume there's a lot of data like that out there that just calls for being graphed, right, and finding... But the algorithms, so, Previous algorithm. So actually, a person who's done a lot on this is Ernest Frankel, who's done some stuff with us and some stuff on his own. He's a professor of bioengineering at MIT and a, a, a longtime visitor to um, Microsoft Research New England. And uh, Dave Carger is his brother-in-law, a well-known <laughs> theoretical computer scientist. And uh, he went to Dave first when he he had. Just like us, he came up with the Steiner tree problem, and he, you know, in, in trying to represent the data, and he went to Dave, and uh, Dave gave him some methods for which he could do some very primitive organisms, but they just didn't scale properly. Right. I mean, they 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 did LP things for, and 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 so they were able to do that in certain very small cases. Um, so having the right algorithms um, is, is the bottleneck, actually. Yeah, and then having good enough data, but yeah, I mean, this is, I mean, this is one of the reasons that, you know, we're starting to work with biologists, right? So in the stand-up, we're, we're doing a big project with Stand Up to Cancer, uh, which is an organization that funds uh, biologists, oncologists working on cancer. And we're doing a big project with them now, which they call Convergence 2.0, in which they're bringing uh, uh, machine learning people who are from some of my labs and some of our collaborators together with biologists and oncologists. And there are two things we want to do. One, we want to use kind of the more black box machine learning to be able to do certain, certain predictions of which drugs will work. And then if we get those, since the FDA probably wouldn't accept the black box, we would then go in and try to do these network analyses to try to get some, um, you know, some mechanism, because the FDA doesn't like it when there's no mechanism. You know, they, like you can't, you can't use your black box on real people. Mm -hmm. have you have, do you have a good example of network science done wrong? So, I mean, there's so many models. Here is so much network science done wrong. Network science, 
Okay, I'm, I'm not going to, I mean, I'm not going to name names. Oh. Um, but, you know, some people, I mean, I say I see networks everywhere, but, um, you know, it doesn't mean I publish it just because I have some hallucination and I see a network someplace. And there are lots of people in network science uh, who, you know, everything is a parallel graph and this explains this and that and the other thing and used a lot in economics and used a lot in things in biology where I think it may be, um, I think it's really important if you go to an application to work with domain experts. You know, so if I'm just doing it myself, you know, it's me and Christian and some great collaborators like Yufe and others and, and then we prove theorems and so that's all fine and that's kosher and we're happy. Um, you know, but if we actually want to do an application, we really try to work with experts in the field because otherwise you just hallucinate explanations based on network science. And, um, you know, I do those in my dreams, but I don't publish them. And some people do. I would have stopped here, but Silvio has his hand up. So, Silvio, you get the last question. I mean, you, you do, there, there definitely are ways of trying to find, um, if we're just talking about people before we have courses, I mean, now you're talking about bipartite networks of people in, in classes. Let's just think about the people themselves. There definitely are algorithms that say, oh, you really should meet this person, okay? And they, they actually work a lot of them. I mean, it's really surprising. Microsoft, I don't know, 10, 12 years ago, you know, did this, and some guy comes up to me. It was Ronnie Kohavi. I don't know if you know Ronnie Kohavi. Yeah. And he came up to me and he said, oh, I just did this thing, and it said I had to meet you. He had just come to us from Amazon, and it was like, I mean, we just knew so many people. I know but probably one of the people we knew. I mean, it was just, it was unbelievable, and disciplinary things and everything. So that, there, there are certainly good, good algorithms for that. Now you're saying let's do kind of a, Bipartite network of people in classes, maybe? Well, not all, could I say I teach alphabet, alphabet, but if you really want to do it correctly, so you, should, you can figure it out a little bit better what type of mixture mm -hmm. you want to, and similarly, if you want to perhaps connect some other Yeah, because a, a class has um, latent and not so latent <laughs> uh, variable, right? But if I, if I know, like, a, a movie, when I know it, I know, you know, what's this genre and this and that. And in a class, um, you can think of as having various characteristics that have to do with the subjects in it and the applications of it. And yeah, and then people themselves have certain interests and they have certain background and they have, yeah, and, and I mean, that's not entirely insane. One could, you know, think about actually trying to model that a little better. The only problem is that um, it's hard to make new courses, right? So, uh, so at the end of the day, forget courses. Assume that you want to do recreational activity to get your research to interact with one another. And so then now you can just say do a pub, okay, that works most of the time. But you know, perhaps you can actually do if you want to attract. Them. What I do in those circumstances when I get, want to get people to work together is I just start working on it and being really excited and then like telling them all people that they all join in and then I can just step away and they go on and they're like total experts. But uh, that, that's my way. So you inject yourself as a Steiner node. I inject myself as a Steiner node. Yeah, maybe that's why I love this model so much. <laughs> okay, on that wonderful note. So let's thank Jennifer again.